Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, we have a fantastic program ahead of us for this afternoon. Um, I just want to point out that while we're going to be running a data panel now, we also have in our expo area some lightning talks by the prototype team. So once again, it's up to you really to decide whichever of these that you want to attend. So now I'm going to invite Professor Teresa Dillon, who is going to be chairing our data panel. Professor Dillon is the co-investigator at Swicton. Over to you, Teresa. Thanks very much for that warm introduction for Arara. I'm delighted to be hosting this panel on data with three amazing women whose work has spanned very different global contexts. Um, one of the things that I was really keen to kind of flag with the panel on data and the environment was the richness in how this topic is now emerging. Um, and I think that a lot of the kind of conversation often in terms of the public imaginary around data and the environment also um, centers quite a lot on things like carbon counting and um, how we can offset in a sense some of our um, and mitigate some of our climate actions. So I was keen in this particular panel to look towards what also a broader sense of environmental justice and climate change might look like. So that's a brief overview of the panel. I would just like to introduce that uh, Katrina and Anna will be sharing here the, the BSL interpreters. Um, for those uh, who would like a further description, I am um, oh, I identify as a white European woman. Um, I'm sitting here in my house in Bedminster. It's like white panel background. Um, I have a red um, scarf on my head and um, I will pass on now to uh, Yaya to introduce and each one of the uh, speakers to introduce themselves and we'll go forward then with the discussion. Thank you. Hey, um, my name is Jaya, uh, but Yaya is worked his fine in, in Germany, it's cool. Um, I am a physicist turned data, science, uh, data scientist turned normal entrepreneur. Uh, I'm CEO of Symantrica Limited, and we're the creators of Varna, the afforestation with data app. I have black hair, it's streaked with silver, and I have a bit of a wild woman of the woods kind of look. Uh, brown skin, very geeky glasses, and I'm sitting in my children's band room with guitars and a chessboard behind me. Um, and yes, very pleased to be here. Thank you. I'll pass on. Thank you, um, Yaya. <laughs> Hannah, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Um, thank you, um, and thank you for the invitation to be here. I might have to just apologize to the audience because I'm having screen sickness, and I might have to switch off my camera, but I'll give you a description of what I look like beforehand. Um, my name is Hannah Mazaros Martin. I'm an advanced researcher at forensic architecture at the University of Gold, um, sorry, Goldsmiths College in the University of London. Um, I'm running a project uh, at the moment with the Columbian Truth Commission. Um, I completed my PhD at Goldsmiths uh, in 2019 at the Center for Research Architecture. Um, and my work is about the aerial fumigation of the coca plant in Colombia. Um, and the data and statistics generated around that conflict, um, which I'll talk about in this talk. I am a white Mediterranean looking woman um, with big brown curly hair, and I'm sitting in my living room in London, um, yeah, surrounded by pictures and a bookshelf. Many thanks, Hannah. Um, Maria Isabel, would you yes. like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Maria Espinosa, Maria Isabel Espinosa. I'm a PhD student at Rutgers University, and I've uh, recently just published a paper where I study with my co author, Melissa Ronsik, uh, how you know, the UN Global Pulse and other organizations have been pushing these uh, data for climate action campaigns under the banner of the Data for Good Movement, and how these sort of campaigns push um, sort of data solutionism that narrows what climate action should be. Um, I'm Peruvian. I'm right now currently in Lima, Peru. I am uh, brown. I identify as mestiza and I have dark hair. And I'm in, in, a, in a sort of office, home office, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for those um, audio descriptions and introductions. So I'd like to open the kind of conversation. 
the way in which you both um, you, with which you all use data in relation to your work about climate change and environmental justice. Give basically people a bit of a flavour of the breadth and the span of this work. Would you um, mind just briefly introducing um, some of the projects that you're working on, particularly those that um, we were flagging in advance for, th for this particular panel? Um, Maria Isabella, would you like to, to open the floor, please? Yes, of course. So as I was saying before, uh, me and my co-author, Melissa Ronship, we interview, um, we look into the data for, for good and the data for climate action campaigns that the UN Global Post have been pushing since 2009. And we interview the people, the sponsors especially, and the organizers of the data for, for climate action campaigns that they've been conducted in 2014 and 2017. And, um, and, you know, like our objective was not to question whether or not the, the, these are sort of like hackathons where like data companies share the data for a limited amount of time. This is the concept of data philanthropy, like the companies is giving the data for the public good. And then scientists have the opportunity to take that data and show that it can show good insights for climate action. And so, well, the data is only shared for a very short period of time, only four months. And so it's very easy, difficult to see if there's actually going to be an impact. And the data is actually, you know, eventually from the apps and data sets that they put together is actually going to be used for policy. But what we're actually looking into is like, what are the motivations of the people behind these campaigns? And so what we found is that many times these companies participate in the campaigns not because they're actually trying to share their data or become more transparent in the way that they do data collection, but they do participate in these campaigns because, you know, it looks really good to be engaged in the data for good movement. It's like basically PR is more about the sustainability of the firm rather than being about sustainable action regarding the environment. And of course, they wanted to be affiliated with the UN grant, the UN brand. And what the other thing what we found is that this is very difficult, um, complicated. Like we have to be very aware that if you know, like in this approach that corporations are taking on regarding data for good, they might be really narrowing down what climate action means. Um, climate action for us might not only be about data solutions, and it's also about being political political engage about it but sometimes these companies try to turn it around so it's all like a technical problem a data gap that we need to fill and that really misses the point thank I'm you just gonna leave it there yeah no i think that this segues very well into um jaya's work in in with vana and um if you could pick up on that please actually in terms of actually this notion of uh, data for good and um, particularly data philanthropy in a sense which actually may also I think connect the work you've been doing um, in terms of trying to support companies in a way a corporate for a form of corporate activism um, through which you're trying to um, encourage uh, companies to look at the land that they own and perhaps re um, use it for rehab reforestation um, how how do you sort of could you give a little bit more of an overview of how you've been um, aggregating this data and um, and looking at it? Sure. Um, so in terms of a bit of background, I we spent the last six years observing and influencing corporate behaviour in relation to human rights uh, regulations, um, and in particular the the Modern Slavery Act here in the UK and um, uh, specifically section 54, which is about supply chain transparency. And transparency is actually fundamental to everything that we do. Um, and we, we kind of segue, it isn't actually a segue, we couldn't find a way of separating human rights and, uh, um, and I suppose social justice from, from environmental justice. So we started to look at companies and how we could reconnect them with the with the future of the planet and it started by looking at available land ownership data because uh, the feedback that we were getting from all of our work in human rights and modern slavery act was that it was an uncomfortable situation to talk about for any company given that their entire supply chains could not be claimed to be slave free or exploitation free it was not a good space for any company to start to step up and say we're doing the right thing because immediately everyone will say well actually you're not in a place of um, moral high ground because you know 
there's exploitation there everywhere if you've got a mobile phone. So we had to shift the conversation somehow. We moved to land ownership for that reason. And also because we're very lucky in the UK that we have um, a, a robust open data infrastructure. Um, and again, you can't have real transparency without open data and you can't have um, effective transparency unless it's in date, that it is up to date. So we, we had to look at it in terms of aggregating as much as we could um, automating as much as we could in terms of little bots going out and gathering what was there on the web, verifying it through human um, analysis as well as um, AI where we where it made sense to do so, um, and and simply trying to make apparent to corporations themselves, people within those corporations didn't know what they owned and they don't know what value that land might be or that asset might be in the fight against climate uh, emergency. So. It, that's kind of where, where we were coming from, was applying supply chain transparency to an environmental mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Um, and, and, and just also picking up on that aspect of human rights and transparency, Hannah, I'd like to bring you back in, into the conversation in relation to the, the work that you've been doing within Colombia, um, and in particular in how a plant, the cocoa plant, was basically outlawed in, in a way. Um, and the aerial fumigation, as you mentioned, that was um, therefore uh, developed as part of this um, outlawing of the plant, in a sense, um, and how that intersects then with human rights and the sort of the slow environmental violence that you speak about within your work. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm totally fascinated by something that Jaya just said about um, companies not even knowing what they own. I would mm -hmm. like I would like to maybe talk about that in a bit because maybe there's something I can try to connect to um, even also in recent work that I've been doing around um, land ownership in the banana industry. But um, I, th I think it's interesting the kinds of clouds and obscuring of data that also even happen for the owners itself, let's say. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk about that a little bit more and how they also understand the land that they may or may not own. Um, no, okay, so my, my work about coca um, kind of is, I, I, I kind of decided that for this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll break it down in three different ways, how I approach um, the generation of coca statistics via um, the analysis of satellite imagery um, and its kind of political and legal effects. So in my own work, I kind of did it, I did this in three parts. Um, I did a field work, like a very intensive field work um, where I went to areas that had been um, aerial, aerially fumigated um, in the south of Colombia. And I kind of traced, um, I, I picked one place in particular and decided to um, trace it through a, ver like a, a variety of different scales of representation. And I kind of, at the at the maybe most obscured um, scale, I I went to the level of the pixel of the satellite image that is also claimed to capture this space of the farm, right? So that was kind of the field work aspect, which involved um, a very close working relationship with the campesinos, the small farmers who had been repeatedly fumigated throughout the years and the very devastating effects to their own lives, to their own health, um, and to their own agricultural practices. Um, the next kind of um, level of analysis that I, uh, I took in relationship to COCA um, was to do kind of an ethno ethnography of institutions that were formulating these statistics. Um, specifically, I focused on the UNODC, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, um, which had been, you know, since 1997, uh, generating yearly annual COCA reports, um, which kind of detailed um, sort of uh, where these cultivations were meant to be taking place around the country. And then, um, and then also the, the US um, and the Colombian government deriving their own statistics um, also through similar means through satellite detection. So um, why this 
became important is because I, I became very concerned in my in my work about the role of data in in conflict and war, and how um, these kinds of numbers that were generated via these images um, began to also play a role in how, um, in this case specifically, aerial fumigation, which is a form of violence, um, was perpetuated on the ground. So that's kind of my approach. And, and sorry, there's a third level here because I am um, what we call like practice-based researcher um, in forensic architecture was kind of to start to do a counter cartography of these images by um, actually working in quite a long-term um, engagement with um, a group of remote sensing scientists. Um, and we started to, to look at the images um, that had been used for this analysis over the years. And instead of actually concentrating on what they show us, um, the idea was to actually look at what they didn't show us. So to look at the various ways that um, the images are actually insufficient for representing, um, yeah, what is considered to be an outlawed and criminalized plant. Thank you very much, Anna. And, and I guess just to be clear as well, for those that are listening, this sort of um, outlawing of the plant in a sense was also part of a, a broader narrative of a war on drugs in a sense to Colombia, correct? Yeah, sorry, the, the, the history of the, of the criminalization of coca and um, also other plants that are considered illegal is like also like beyond, beyond the bounds of just Colombia. I mean, the most like, uh, and also it dates back to colonial times and to the colonization of um, Latin America. Uh, and, you know, I mean, it's it's been a criminalized practice for centuries, but this is its latest incarnation, right, in the in the war on drugs and it being um, condemned as a illegal species um, in the UN, basically, um, which gave it further legitimacy for various governments to go and um, eradicate the plant. Um, so yeah, that's, that's to give you a very brief, brief history of that. Yes. Of yeah, that yeah. Conflict. yeah. Yeah, I appreciate the time is not on our side here, but um, I think the thread there that you picked up also, Hannah, regarding, and I think that links uh, all of your work really is this emphasis and in some ways, as as you mentioned, on a, on a kind of um, a, the corporate sort of sensibility here or the state sensibility um, in a sense, depending on, on on whether you look at this war on drugs in a sense. And you, what you mentioned, Hannah, that you would kind of want to return there to um, what um, Yara was saying as well earlier on in, in terms of picking up, you know, what a company knows that they own and what they don't own. And I think this links back very well to Maria Isabella's work um, in terms of looking at like corporate responsibility and, you know, the notion of data kind of for good. Um, in terms of the uh, work there that you're speaking to in, in terms of land ownership in relation to the banana industry and, and also just land ownership in, in general, in a sense, um, Maria Isabel, what was in the interviews did did your did your work uh, touch upon this in a sense about looking at the assets that a kind of a, a company might own um in terms of actually how they might look towards data um you know for 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 climate good or or data for change or were you just looking at how this notion of data philanthropy in a sense manifested yeah um we didn't really look at that um at the what the company owns and how where they are what land they own or how like how sustainable is the change uh, the commodity change production uh, but we did um we did look that for for many of these companies engaging in data for good is not only good pr it's also a good way for them to um reach new markets so there, there is an in, like they see national governments and national statistics of offices as a potential client. Um, they also, so in a way, it's also sort of just perpetuating the current data collection uh, practices they have now. I remember that I at some point we interview a company that has weather data. And the company was saying that their interest in, you know, participating in this UN platform was because they were very interested in working in Mexico and South America and, and African countries, in, in Western African countries. 
uh, because they saw there was potential to go there and install new weather, new infrastructure to collect more weather data. So what they were thinking about the future was to continue using this model where they give free access to such a just a limited amount of data and then adding a subscription if you wanted to get more detailed data. So that was like a way for them to reach new markets. But uh, so if, if you see like the company is never going to give anything for free. Philanthropy is never going to solve our problems, right? So it, it, for them, it's about sustaining their practices. It's about PR. So Anna, would you, uh, would you like to pick up a little bit on that in terms of actually the work of the company and, 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 and what the app is now sort of attempting? Because I feel like you, 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 you're using some of this discursive logic and narrative of data for good and data philanthropy to sort of, you know, um, engage the corporates in a sense to look at their land assets. Sorry, who is that? Um, what did you say? Oh, it was me. Sorry, you can't tell. And I wasn't sure if it was me. Um, so, could you repeat that, please? Because I, I didn't know. Yeah. That was no no that, that's fine i was i was just uh, relating to how your app actually vana is also looking towards you know some of these narratives that um maria isabel is is pointing to in terms of uh data for good and data philanthropy you're sort of using this uh discursive uh method in a sense through which to engage the companies and ha ha can you kind of give an overview of actually um how that has been going and whether that has been successful and um you know where they also see, place themselves on that kind of uh position in a sense and do they see where do they see the value how do they sort of uh think about it themselves okay so um from, from my experience um having been working with a load of companies for many years now corporate legal entities behave like sociopaths um, it's not it's not that they're inherently evil it's just that they are a vehicle um, that contains people that are human but um, there's a thick membrane around that that entity that that dehumanizes pretty much everything that it would touch unless it's legislated to do so so the regulatory environment matters in terms of where that company is born and what it has to deal with but its primary functions are to maximize profit minimize risk um, give shareholders their value that they need. Um, however, and, and also corporate transparency does not come naturally, it must be legislated and then it evens a playing field for absolutely every corporate out there. And it enables the humans in there to do some good. So corporate head for me has always been, you know, the board, the one that determines, you know, shareholder value and dividends and sort of the financial aspect and, and the, the risk aspect. The corporate heart are those people um, uh, enabled to, to interact and understand the impact that they have on the planet. That thick membrane has to become more permeable. And what we've seen is that when you've got open data and mandated transparency that is not 12 months after year end, you start to have some decent conversations because people can poke through that membrane and start to say, actually, we can do some good. Um, not just that, when you've got the transparency, then um, you can get the hold of good, reliable data. And good, reliable data can lead to good policy. And we also know the opposite effect is, you know, bad data, bad data can destroy lives. And we've seen that here in the UK with the universal credit and how, how people have been turned into statistics and the, the human condition is no longer understandable in anything other than you know, financial metrics. So, yeah, the work that we've been doing has been trying to do both. And so we've been using data where available to provide a business case for companies to do good. Those companies are actually those points, those people within those companies that need that business case that we have to reach in and get to them. Um, and then once we've got that case to them, we can reach into those people again and get them involved in more activism. One, one of the key things we've discovered is, you know, people who haven't spent much time in nature don't really feel that connection. And uh, the work that we lead has led us to sedentary lives within our offices, now within our bedrooms <laughs> and our bedrooms. And we, we need to reconnect with what's going on out there before we can humanise the work that we do in the context of that corporate structure. Thank you. Hannah, you wanted to also comment on that in terms of the, the, uh, the work that you, were, you mentioned that you were doing in, in terms of the banana industry. Do you, do you want to return to some of those points? No, I, I just think it's, um, it's an interesting thing to 
kind of look at in the reverse, like from the perspective of the companies, because what a lot of like, um, you know, land reclamants have to deal with at the moment. So people who have been displaced from their land who are um, trying to go back is that there's often a lot of barriers to, um, of access to information and data um, that would even show them who is owning the, the land, right? So it's interesting, just when you said that, to think about it from the from the reverse, that the companies themselves might not even know um, what land they own. And I mean, I think that this has a really interesting history, which I know is probably particular, I mean, to whatever company you might be looking at. But I mean, in the case of like, yeah, for example, in the case of Chiquita, um, in Colombia and their kind, the kinds of ways in which they um, ended up um, dispersing and occluding their own assets, um, even probably for themselves um, in a way, uh, is interesting to think about from the reverse, that they might not also understand the lands that they own um, at a certain point. But anyway, that's, that was just my, my, my chain of thought about that. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you, you all have addressed in, in providing a, a sort of a, a, you know, quick summary of your work and insight into the ways in, in which you both use data, capture data and some of the methodologies, whether it's interviews or aerial photography um, or the, the pixel level that you're working at or that you're using open data or land registry data. And um, I'd just like to, as we kind of come to, a, you know, a close to the conversation as well, is just that where, in a sense, do you see this, the relation between data, climate change and environmental justice going, particularly when I think uh, when we think towards um, COP26, which is happening in Scotland at, at the beginning of this year, and where you sort of see the role of the type of work that you do in relation to data activism and climate change sort of sitting and, and maybe you could just have a closing comment on that or, or if, if it's not something that you're currently thinking about maybe provide a, a link to to what you're you're currently working on or speak to that thank you um hannah maybe perhaps we can go in the reverse order this time <laughs> oh i mean about yeah i i actually don't know if i can address this question so much just because of my own work i'm not really dealing with um climate change in that particular way um, so maybe the others want to, I'm curious what the others have to say. Great, thank you. I think that, um, like, you know, data can be used for good. And it's very important that it's like grassroots, like, are like you know, organizations on the ground using the data to make processes more transparent and help companies accountable, especially in regards to the carbon footprint. I think that is super important. Uh, but I do think that in... In platforms like uh, COP26, like we're definitely going to see from the side of data companies trying to push this narrative that the solution to the climate crisis is innovation and is in technology. And I think we need to be very wary of those, of, of, of bringing the conversation into the right direction. And also, like what, that, that, what does that mean for countries in the global south that don't have the technology infrastructure and are dealing with other problems? Um, and this also brings it back to climate justice, right? Like if we're actually talking about climate justice, we need to really assess what's, you know, what are the needs and what's happening with countries in the global south in terms of climate action. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, I'll um, add to that. Um, so from, again, because I've been focusing on corporates, I have to say that um, we, we've been talking a lot about sort of philanthropy, you know, CSR and all sorts of things. So CSR, corporate social responsibility, needs to start with transparency. Because without the truth, we have no baseline and we have no idea what is actually going on. We get a lot of greenwash and whitewash and every kind of rainbow copper wash. We can't, we can't establish what's going on without people being honest about what is happening. And that has to be legislated across every country that claims to be doing something about climate change. Equally, when we're talking about data philanthropy and how we can use data for good, it's got to start with open data because if you've got data in a silo, it goes off really quickly and it's no longer useful. It has a limited shelf life. By being connected and open with those data sets, we can start to really see um, where we're making progress and where we're falling down. So if we're using data to inform our strategies and our actions, then it's got to be correct. 
Case in point, land registry data. We know, and land registry knows that you know, forty percent of that data um, it has to be cleaned because it's no longer in it's 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 out of date. And this data is 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 um, allowed to perpetuate because it's dependent on companies going back and telling the land registry that it's all changed. So one of our first first um, uh, challenges will be to clean that data, and there's a massive, great big litter picking to be done on that. We need a framework for that honesty and from, for that activism. So that, we, for, as a data scientist, that is where I'm drawing my battleground. Thank you for <laughs> the battleground there. But I guess that does also open up about like what are the limits then of open data as well, and where where you sort of see that perhaps in terms of um, I guess the efforts that are there are, are required to keep data you know fresh so to speak the fact that we sometimes particularly with open data you know the taxpayer pays for it and then we get a packaged back to us in various different services which we sometimes have to pay for again I mean where do you sort of see the just lines lying there um, that would be really good to sort of weed out a little bit more um, okay, so I, I'm under no illusions about the limits of open data. Uh, that there is only so much that corporate, for example, will be able to share without it um, compromising its own um, privacy and its own IP and various other things. However, by connecting to open data, you can make that siloed data actually useful, and it can keep keep those organisations honest. Um, and I, I I think that when you're trying to migrate from well when you're trying to look at how open data feeds into the whole of the landscape it is part of um a planetary asset um it's it should be available as a utility if we pay our taxes we are owed that data we are owed what's going on we're owed it in as real time as we can or at least within 30 days um which is um for, for a corporate really good <laughs> um it should be the starting point is transparency and only things that are hidden for sake of national security or personal security. Those are the reasons why you would hide certain bits of data. So we, we must have another conversation now, especially given that if you've got an AI that's trying to make you know, real decisions on policy and on the lives of millions, um, AI is going to need um, an open data infrastructure to be able to use because they can't see into everything. So the quality of our data will become the quality of um, our, our, um, our regulatory framework and our justice systems. So mm -hmm. it, it is a foundation. We can't overlook it. Mm -hmm. We can't underestimate it. It seems to me then we're speaking very much though about value, a systematic change in, in, in value systems here as well. And that that's actually also what is part of this kind of conversation, particularly when we think back to, you know, the work, Maria Isabel, of, of your, um, that, that your work revealed in, in terms of corporate responsibility here in, in a way as well, that in, in some ways the, the value that they were sort of, the corporates were seeing, and I say corporates here very generally, were seeing in being engaged with uh, climate kind of conversation, so to speak, was for their own profit at the end of the day, or was in terms of a particular narrative sustainability that they kind of want to see. But what actually uh, Jaya is speaking towards is actually a, a sort of a more um, ethical value value shift in a sense. And I, t I think that that's where we're at in a sense, because we're kind of coming to a period where Data, for example, felt like a, the what the Wild West. It was a land grab in a sense, and there was a digital um, disposition that was uh, um, going on in relation to it. And now we're sort of somehow getting wise, and it feels to me that there's a conversation that's happening at the moment. We're at, we're at this juncture where actually the control of your own data on a personal level, or the use and value of data that is um, collected on our behalf, or that is in the public realm, or is open, um, has to be used in a particular way that is, is for good. And I think we're sort of beginning to have those deep conversations, or starting to have those kind of public conversations. Do you have that sense as well at this moment in time that this is happening? I, I say this generally to to whoever may want to pick, pick that up. Um, Marie Isabel, if you yeah, I like I think I just wanted to um, say, repeat or like reinforce this idea that probably what drove these companies to participate in this data for climate action was because climate action is very good for their data collection. 
So that that it's like I think the like they need to re rebuild trust in the public and regain you know like re rebuild trust because they the companies are being more and more concerned over all the like citizens are becoming way more vigilant of what is happening how they're getting digitally dispossessed and how that data creates value how it is used and like what will happen next right like we there's a push towards regulation I, I know in the UK there were way more stronger regulations that I mean we don't have them yet in the US but like I think that's that's the step forward and I think companies are using I mean the campaigns I looked at was climate action but they also are doing campaigns about many other things right about poverty about uh, post disaster relief humanitarian crisis and so i think like that those it, it is really um it's really important that we question like if okay if companies are going to engage in these campaigns we really need them to be transparent and we really <laughs> we really need to know what what is the impact of that data sharing are they actually sharing the data and also like i think this is also something that is going to become more concerning in coming years but like are they giving us our data back like like that is also something that we need to question like mm. how is that mm. happening mm. hannah i guess this question of transparency is central to the work that forensic architecture do um as much of your work as the company's work or the group's work is is, is focused on making uh transparent the links um in relation to various types of justice that your your group have worked with um how central is it for you as a as a a concept within your work um or is it something that you have paid particular attention to that notion of transparency well i guess i mean as i was saying with the generation of coca statistics um actually there's a lot of um non-transparency right uh there's a lot of um actually secrecy i mean especially around um the you know the actual methodologies and and all sorts of, yeah, and the images that are used to generate these statistics. So a lot of what I was interested in for a long time is trying to find those things. And then when I realized that um, maybe paying attention to what was there was probably uh, a, a futile task, I actually started to look at what, yeah, what the, that lack of image actually meant. And that was especially um, relevant when I was trying to go after the data in relationship to the fumigation specifically. So where the fumigation had actually physically taken place um, over the decades all around Colombia. Um, so I started to do kind of a separate ethnography of uh, where that data had gone and where it couldn't be seen. Um, mm. Yes. I know, I think that's really interesting in that there's so much emphasis on on data revealing and seeing and um, aggregating in a sense that as you're pointing out there, what's the data that's hidden or the data that's surfaced or, the, uh, or um, purposefully, intentionally um, negated somehow in a way tells as powerful a story as that that which is seen, which is actually, I think, a really um, powerful point in a sense to, to, to kind of... Um, flag here. I'm going to take a question from the floor. We have, um, how do you preserve your own self-care and well-being while spending so much time with people who only care about profits above all else? Strong. <laughs> I think. Yeah. 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 Right, so, okay, I'll, I'll take this from the corporates I've been working with. And um, you've got to separate out that corporate behavior with the human inside because the job description that they're given, their line management, all of that in the company culture tends to try and keep you on track with the, the three corporate objectives, maximize profit, minimize risk, and um, make sure shareholders get their value. So we, we, we do need to help those people start to change the conversation to look at sustainable profits. And I, I don't think it's a hard, hard conversation to have. Um, and what's, what's interesting though, is that without the lack of transparency, it enables a level of corporate bystander um, effect, which is pretty much what, you know, I can give you data that says, um, there's exploitation in this supply chain, you need to talk to this supplier and sort it out. But 
I still need to prove that that person got that data and that they were empowered enough to act on it. That person will probably fling it up the chain and then they'll not see where it goes. And every large organization turns into this, um, uh, this complete fracture of where the responsibility lies. And it is inherent in every organization that has, has multiple departments. You've got finance that can't talk to marketing, that can't talk to compliance, that can't talk to, to it, it's, it's um, not set up for an easy ride in that way. So we, we do need to reach into several different parts of those companies. And what we've seen with TISC Report actually is that we've made those conversations easier because the conversation happens via TISC Report <laughs> from compliance to TISC Report to marketing and suddenly there starts to be a bit of action. So there's a massive disconnect in many different levels. And um, I take um, my, my, my hope, the self-care, well-being, my sanity depends on finding those people who get it um, and if I don't find them, I will move on to someone who does. And I'll come back to the person that has the power with hopefully the right proposition that gets them to, to do something different. So, yeah, it, it can be quite depressing, but I don't allow that to last for long. There's always someone good in there. Always. Thank you. Hannah, Maria, Isabella, is there any hopeful note that you would like to end on with the work that you do that is often at the forefront of also working either with corporates or with unjust systems that helps you protect yourself and, and, and weather the storms? <laughs> I, I will say that I'm with Jaja in the sense of, um, you're right, like the, the way that the organization is set up doesn't help at all. And it's, it's and, and, and the people, you know, the people at these, at least the people that I interview, they're very smart people and they're very well intended and they do want to engage in this conversation otherwise they wouldn't have agreed to talk to me. So I think they, they were happy to receive the criticism or to hear it, although I didn't see it directly, but they were happy to have a dialogue and a conversation. So um, I think that, yeah, it's very, if I would be trying to change it from within, I think it would be very important to find people like that, people who are aware and try to organize them within the, the corporation to make a more sustainable change and to try to shift the direction of the of the organization. Thank you. Hannah, would you like to say anything? <laughs> about about self-care and well being. Yeah. Yes. Um well I don't know if I can really answer that question about being close to like I guess corporate evil, like, <laughs> and self-care. I mean, I, I think, you know, you know, in, in, in the work that we do, um, it can get very, very difficult. I mean, obviously, um, you deal with uh, very tough subjects every day. And I think it's about actually giving your workmates and, and your colleagues around you a lot of support um, and checking in and also not just your colleagues, but also the people you are working with, right? Um, also in the field. And I don't know, that's, I think what makes me last is just the care that kind of comes through um, teams and friendships um, and the work itself. Yeah, vitally important, I think. Thank you, as you say, for when, particularly when you're working on, on, on such um, strong issues in, in relation to, to justice in, in general. Um, I'd like to kind of come to a close and just to say thank you all for participating in, in this some kind of meandering conversation in a way which was intended to look at the different ways through which I think we can broaden our notion of what does data in relation to the the environment, environmental justice and climate change actually mean and to move it beyond this, this kind of like categorization, as I was saying, of collecting uh, data points or tracking and quantifying yourself or or, or others or, um, in, in relation to reducing carbon emissions and so forth. And I just wanted to ensure that when we speak to data and the environment that we can look at these broader practices in a sense, which are either, you know, trying to change corporate culture or trying to change particular relationships um, with um, institutions or countries in a sense, and in, in the way that they are dealing with issues um, in relation to broader climate climate change and, and environmental justice. So thank you all for spending time with us today and from coming from different quarters of the planet and to 
um, Maria Isabel, especially for coming in from Peru <laughs> at a, a much different time than us. I do appreciate all your efforts and uh, look forward to continued conversations and wishing you all success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Thank it's been you. Lovely hearing about your stories as well, Anna Maria. Yeah, Thank great you. to know about your work.